So um, my topic today is physical therapies for prevention and treatment of pelvic organ prolapse. And since I'm leading the ICS and IUGA committee on definitions and terminology, we don't like these physical therapies because I th actually what I'm going to talk about is pelvic floor muscle training. It can be done by a physical therapist, but it doesn't have to be done by a physical therapist. So why should we do peripheral muscle training at all for pelvic organ prolapse? Kegel, back in 1952, he said that with adequate peripheral muscle training, the woman learns to maintain the perineum, bladder, and uterus in a higher position. The slack in the supporting muscles will be taken up, and the vagina will become longer and tighter. Another reason for conservative treatment is that pelvic surgery is a risk factor by itself, and there are severe complications after prolapse surgery, especially with a mesh. And we also know that about 30 to 58 percent need reoperation of the pop surgery, so they are not really effective in the first line. So I think we also need to add physiotherapists and those who are working with the exercise science into this area to try to have our vision into the pelvic organ prolapse. The theory behind strength training for pelvic floor, the pelvic floor muscle is that we are building up a structural support and trying then to lift up uh, the pelvic floor into a higher anatomical location inside the pelvis to try to create hypertrophy of the muscles and closing of the levator hiatus. This will again create stiffness in the connective tissue within and around the muscles. And this may, uh, why we are getting this into a higher position, make it possible to have an automatic function and then it start to work as it does for us who do not have problems in this area. So the treatment options today should be based on evidence-based practiced and randomized control trials and systematic reviews. And watchful waiting, a very interesting, came up as one option uh, some years ago by the study from Sweden from Middle. Uh, they found that they looked at women with pelvic organ prolapse uh, for five years and followed them, and 47% had unchanged uh, POPQ measure staged. 40% had regression and 13% had a progression. And I think the 40% regression, that's the very interesting thing, and that's also what uh, Dr. Kruger has been talking about. So then, what about pessary as one uh, treatment option? The level of evidence for pessaries are 2B, because there are no trials with pessary compared to nothing. Surgery, again, the level of evidence is not very strong because there are only comparisons between different surgical methods and procedures. So we lack evidence from studies comparing again with nothing or with pessary or with pelvic floor muscle training. So level of evidence differ between different studies and in different systematic reviews. When it comes to pelvic floor muscle training, the level of evidence now is quite clear. It's 1A from the ICI uh, document in 2013. This is based on eight randomized controlled trials of pelvic organ prolapse and pelvic floor muscle training. And the first one came out from Thailand in 2003, and the last one was in 2014. So this is quite a new area, but there are high quality randomized controlled trials. The results show that typically uh, in, in some of these studies that are looked into anatomical prolapse that you can lift one stage. Not more has been seen, but one stage lift, and that can come from three to two or two to one or one to zero. <coughs> they all improved symptoms uh, in these RCTs, and there's also effect of, on uh, core mobility, like urinary incontinence and bowel prob problems as well. And these studies have all used uh, palpation to assess correct peripheral muscle contraction before they started. And the studies have uh, different uh, interventions. Some are done in group, uh, and some are done uh, only with individual, uh, and some are combinations of uh, these training regimens. And the exercise protocols, when you look into that, is that the mode has been always strength training for the pelvic floor muscles. Frequency is often uh, once a week with the physiotherapist. The intensity is close to maximum contractions in all of these studies. 
duration of the training period uh, differ between 3.5 months and up to six months. And a six month, that's our studies from Norway. Adherence, there is a variation in adherence, but basically in these eight trials, the adherence is high. Uh, in our study, we assessed peripheral muscle strength and endurance before and after and compared that with a control group that were told to do the NAC. And as you can see, the strength had a, a tremendous increase with an effect size of 1.2. So from um, so the difference between the groups uh, were uh, about 13 uh, centimeter of water, and it was the same seen with a very high effect size again uh, in endurance of the muscles. And this is how we measure it. We are looking at the vaginal resting pressure and then ask the participants to do three maximal voluntary contractions. That's the strength, and we do the mean of these three. And and then we asked them to hold the contraction for 10 seconds, and uh, that's the local muscle endurance. So that's measured also in centimeter uh, of water uh, per, uh, in 10 seconds. And in this uh, particular study, again, we had 109 women, and we looked into the differences between the exercise and the, and the control group in morphological changes on the muscles. And what we see here is the difference between the groups. And the muscle thickness incre increased with 15.6% uh, in favor of the uh, exercise group. The heightal area was reduced with 6.3%. The muscle length was also decreased by 4.2%. And we also had a, a lift of the bladder neck of 4.3 millimeter, and a lift of the rectal ampulla with 6.7 millimeter. And when we ask the patient to do a valsalva, the heightal area and the muscle length was uh, less expanded during this maneuver, uh, indicating also an automatic function of the pelvic floor muscles during this maneuver. So what about uh, long-term follow-up? I have only been able to find one study on the long-term follow-up, and this is from Hagen and coworkers. That was an abstract at uh, Ayuga. Uh, the follow-up uh, was of a multicenter uh, single-blind RCT. And the outcome was pelvic organ prolapse symptom score and compared to, f uh, and also, sorry, uh, and also further treatment, who wanted to have further treatment. The results uh, was that they had a, a loss to follow-up. The response rate was 40%. Uh, however, uh, we didn't find any significant differences between groups uh, two years after, but uh, there were 12% versus 30% in favor of the peripheral muscle training group uh, that wanted further treatment. And there, uh, the, there was 6% versus 13% having surgery. So uh, some effect there also in the long-term effect, um, uh, long-term run. Um, and they also discussed that the lack of significant differences in the symptoms may be due to further treatment in the control group because it's very difficult to have follow-up studies because usually you have some treatment in the follow-up period. So what about hyperpressive exercises? This is an exercise uh, regimen that was created and developed in France and it's been usually basically used in southern Europe. Uh, it's not known at all in Northern Europe. Uh, there are uh, two uh, studies so far that I have seen in this uh, written in English. One is a study, an experimental study from Brazil. 36 nolipare uh, physiotherapists were assessed with surface EMG. And they did the hyperpressive uh, uh, technique and show that it was significantly less effective than pelvic floor muscle contraction in increasing the activity of the pelvic floor muscles. Uh, using the technique plus pelvic floor muscle uh, contraction did not uh, differ from pelvic floor muscle contraction alone. And the um, hyperpressive technique uh, activated the transverse abdominus more than the pelvic floor muscles, but adding pelvic floor muscle contractions to the hyperpressive technique significantly again increased the transverse abdominal contraction. And then there was a single blind randomized control trial also from uh, Brazil with 58 uh, women with pelvic organ prolapse stage two. They were randomized to pelvic floor muscle training or pelvic floor muscle training plus hypopressive technique or a control group, which was lifestyle uh, only. 
and they didn't find any effect of adding hypopressive technique regarding peripheral muscle strength, endurance, endurance or cross-sectional area of the muscle. So that's the only thing that I've been able to find on this technique. So what about physiotherapy before and after reconstructive uh, uh, surgery for pelvic organ prolapse? This study from uh, Pulse and co-workers in 2013 looked at 49 women randomized to either physiotherapy two weeks preoperatively and then two, four, six, eight, and 12 weeks postoperatively. And that was compared with standard care. The outcome was called to life, POPQ, and surface EMG. The results uh, found no significant differences between groups except for surface EMG in favor of physiotherapy or pelvic floor muscle training. And then the optimal randomized trial from Barber published in 2014. Uh, this is again an RCT on 374 women on the undergoing surgery for both apical vaginal pop and uh, stress urinary incontinence. 186 of these women had pelvic floor muscle training and 188 usual care. And they had a two-year follow-up, uh, and 84.5% uh, were represented also at a follow-up. Pelvic floor muscle training consisted of individual visit two to four weeks before surgery, and then four post-operative <coughs> visits two, four, six, and 12 weeks afterwards. Uh, we don't know if it was physiotherapists who were doing this uh, intervention, and it's not really very much explained about the program either. They used the Brink score to assess perifloral muscle function. The result was there was no association with greater improvement in urinary uh, incontinence score at six months, POPQ scores, uh, or anatomic su success at 24 months. And there were no difference between groups in Brink score either. So no effect uh, of this trial. And adherence, again, was quite high. So we cannot explain uh, why they didn't work, uh, mm -hmm. because they were not doing the exercises, because they actually have reported to have been doing them. So then, what about um, uh, prevention? Albert Einstein said that intellectuals <laughs> solve nice. problems, but geniuses prevent them. And I think the main thing is how can we managed not to get into this situation. Uh, there, I've only been able to find one uh, trial on this, and I'm calling this a secondary prevention of pelvic organ prolapse, because it was 407 women with a mean age of 46.6 years and median parity of two, and as you can see, up to 11 uh, in parity. Uh, not seeking treatment. However, they had, and some of these women had POPQ stage 1 to 3. Uh, and this was also a two-year follow-up. So they followed the patients to see if anything changed in their stage of uh, pelvic organ prolapse during that time period. They used pelvic organ symptom score, <coughs> and uh, the women were randomized to either lifestyle advice leaflet or five uh, uh, physiotherapy appointments over 16 weeks, plus two six weeks blocks of once a week Pilates classes, including pelvic floor muscle training. And the results showed that it was uh, effective uh, uh, effect between pelvic floor muscle training and control. So it was uh, fewer with symptoms in the pelvic floor muscle training uh, group. So what about primary pre prevention? Because this is what really we want to see. But in my opinion, it's very unlikely that we are able, will be able to have ongoing high quality RCTs for 20 to 30 years. I don't think it will ever happen, unfortunately. We have some studies that was also referred to by um, my former uh, presenter. Differences in pelvic floor muscle training was shown in women with and without pelvic organ prolapse. So women with, uh, without pelvic organ prolapse have better pelvic floor muscle function than those uh, with prolapse. And also, as I said, we found significant and clinically relevant morphological changes seen uh, after pelvic floor muscle training in women with pelvic organ prolapse. Hence, it's possible to change the morphology, which would be very important when we are think thinking about uh, prevention. 
So what about implementation after this? Is it possible now to do anything in pelvic floor muscle training or in regular exercise classes? I think it's really hard to say because we don't have the data, but I think we have uh, a lot from theory and, and what we have seen in the treatment studies that we could build on. So again, physical therapy for pelvic organ prolapse, and uh, I'm really talking about the pelvic floor muscle training, but the physiotherapist would also do other things that pelvi than pelvic floor muscle training. So we will be we'll working in health promotion and prevention. And uh, this is a new area of research, but we have theory, and we have eight RCTs, and we have systematic reviews to support uh, that pelvic floor muscle training is effective in treatment of pelvic organ prolapse. There is a dose response issue in all exercise programs. So it depends on what we are do, what outcome we will have. Uh, and it's like this also in, in, in prolapse because we see that the more intensive program, the better is the result. Uh, there are no studies on primary prevention so far. Uh, however, I think it's possible to say that we should enhance lifelong physical activity and pelvic floor muscle training together, so not only physical activity in general, but also to train the pelvic floor muscles. Uh, we should avoid obesity, and that goes together with general exercises. Avoid constipation and straining, and stop smoking. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Um, we have uh, three more minutes, a little bit less than three more minutes. Maybe we can, somebody can ask a question if somebody wants to come to the microphone. Uh, the floor would be open for one or two questions. Okay, so I, I think I will take the privilege of being the chair today and ask you a question. Uh, this was a very interesting presentation, I, and I think it's it's really impressive what was done in the past year regarding physiotherapy and prolapse. Mm -hmm. So I think it's quite good, and I I talked to the people who are doing the update on the Cochrane Review, and apparently there's even more trials that can be added to that. I, I, I would like to ask you a question regarding prevention uh, of prolapse. More and more in our clinical practice, um, the women after delivery, uh, they want to go back to running. Running is very popular right now in Canada, I don't know, in the other countries. So uh, in your opinion, uh, what should we tell those women? Maybe we don't have the data to know what to tell them uh, if we want to prevent prolapse. Very good question and impossible to answer. <laughs> I, last week I was three days uh, at the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, and we are writing uh, guidelines for uh, at, um, elite athletes when they, what they should do during pregnancy and how, f well, when can they go back to sport? Mm -hmm. and, and of course we can't answer because there are so few studies on elite athletes. But I think in general that physiotherapists may have been a bit too reluctant and too careful uh, about uh, saying that they, you should wait and you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. Because I think some women, they have a healthy and normal pregnancy, they have a small child, no problem, no injuries, and they can go back very, very soon. We see actually in some of the elite at least they go back in the first week starting to do exercises. It all depends on if you have symptoms or not. But we don't have any data to support mm -hmm. this. And I think now that the IOC have recognized this, that we will be able to do studies and follow. Our plan is to follow a cohort of elite athletes throughout the world, starting with Olympics. Okay. So maybe in some years we can say something more. But uh, for the moment, I think it's a very important question. And we don't have the answer. The but answer. I, in general, I think we have been a bit too worried. Mm -hmm. Maybe. So, so maybe ask if there are symptoms, and if there's not symptoms, then they can progress. Yes. And we will look forward to the result of your uh, next studies on that. So maybe one last question before we move on. Thank you. 
Has there been any suggestion in the literature or by colleagues, and I understand we don't have any data on prevention, of um, prescribing or wearing a pessary in the postpartum period, be that one or two years, especially for women, as you mentioned, who are interested in engaging in high impact type of activities? Mm -hmm. We haven't seen anything, and I was working with Ingrid Nygaard on this uh, at the IOC, uh, but we are actually writing in that document that that could be used if they have symptoms of prolapse. We wouldn't do it without symptoms, but if they have symptoms, that we, then they could wear uh, uh, a pessary. So secondary prevention. Yes, okay. sort of. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bo, for this very nice presentation. <laughs>